A high-profile murder trial is unfolding right now in Dedham, Massachusetts, that has many people divided. It's spawned a federal investigation into how the state handled the case, and the biggest supporter behind the defendant was arrested for witness intimidation. For many people following this case, it's not cut and dry, and allegations from both sides have raised questions. The defendant is Karen Reed, and the victim is her boyfriend. Boston police officer John O'Keefe. Prosecutors say Reed backed her SUV into O'Keefe while dropping him off at an after party, leaving him on the front lawn to die from a combination of blunt force trauma and hypothermia. Witnesses at the party say O'Keefe never arrived. He never entered that home, owned by a fellow Boston police officer, Brian Albert. The defense believes O'Keefe did enter that party that night, and after a fight between several attendees, including the homeowner's dog, everyone worked to cover it up. The defense has specifically named Brian Albert, his nephew Colin, who was 17 at the time, and Brian Higgins, an ATF agent with alleged romantic ties to Karen Reed. There's a lot of names and theories floating around, but I'm going to try to do my best to summarize while giving the key points from both sides. The question I have for you all is, do you believe that Karen Reed murdered John O'Keefe? Do you believe someone else at the party killed John O'Keefe? Or do you think an intoxicated Karen Reed accidentally backed up into him and simply drove away without knowing? Karen Reed was raised in a quiet suburb in Virginia. She played piano and regularly attended mass with her family. She excelled at a private Catholic school in Taunton during her teenage years. A close friend described her as always outgoing and sociable. She and Reed were both members of the National Honor Society and took AP classes. For one class, Reed volunteered at a nursing home. One of her teachers recalled Reed forming a deep bond with one of the elderly residents who was struggling with health issues nearing the end of her life. He recalled, quote, She was a remarkable, young, mature woman who showed such compassion and sensitivity. Karen Reed graduated in 1998 with a quote from a British writer, B.S. Pritchett, under her senior photo. Youth is the period of assumed personalities and disguises. It is the time of the sincerely insincere. Seniors were also asked about their ambition. To that, Reed referenced the doors, to break on through to the other side. Next, Reed enrolled at Bentley University, where her father was the dean of business. She graduated early with a degree in finance and received her master's degree in 2004. Soon after, a 24-year-old Reed would meet John O'Keefe, four years her senior. They dated briefly, but their career paths ultimately ended the relationship. O'Keefe was going into the police force, and Reed's work took her to Dublin, Ireland. At the age of 25, Reed was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. She had to undergo 10 surgeries in just 10 years. She suffered temporary blindness and had to use a colostomy bag. A renowned clinic was able to perform a major reconstructive surgery on her intestines, allowing some form of relief, according to her father. A little more than a decade later, Reed received another diagnosis, multiple sclerosis. Reed eventually returned to Boston, Massachusetts. She was hired by Fidelity Investments and became an adjunct professor at Bentley. A former colleague said Reed was generous and funny. They recalled that shortly before the pandemic, a summer party for the interns fell through, but Reed stepped up and booked a fancy restaurant out of her own pocket so they could all celebrate. But not everyone has something nice to say about their interactions with Karen Reed. While living in Mansfield, she frequently clashed with her older neighbors. In April 2020, she called the police on them saying they were being too loud while she was trying to teach her online class. When police arrived, they reported that the neighbors weren't making any noise. Seven months later, the neighbors, a 63-year-old couple, was the one who called police on Reed.
They said they had vacuumed and mowed their lawn, causing their dog to start barking. Reed came over to their house, quote, yelling and screaming, and told them, wait and see, you'll be sorry. Police arrived at the scene and rang Reed's doorbell, but she didn't answer. Besides those minor disputes, Karen Reed hasn't had any interactions with police and no prior record until John O'Keefe's death. During lockdown in 2020, Reed and O'Keefe reconnected through social media. O'Keefe apparently started the conversation saying, quote, blast from the past. At this point, John O'Keefe was the legal guardian of his niece and nephew, whose parents had both suddenly passed away from medical issues. Reed really admired his compassion for stepping up to raise them. The pair started dating, and Reed became deeply involved in raising the children, spending most nights at O'Keefe's home. But the couple also had their issues. On New Year's Eve 2021, they had a massive argument, just weeks before O'Keefe's death. Reed said he had been out all night getting drunk and didn't come back until 3 a.m., leaving her with the full responsibility to take care of the kids. Reed said it made her feel like she'd been taken advantage of. Despite that, she still viewed him as the patron saint of Canton, Massachusetts. Prosecutors paint a very different picture of their relationship towards the end. They believe there was a growing animosity after Reed accused him of cheating with a friend's sister. This apparently happened on a trip to Aruba. Prosecutors have several voicemails Reed left for him where she's swearing at O'Keefe and accusing him of cheating. In the days before O'Keefe died, prosecutors say he was repeatedly trying to break off the relationship. And that brings us to the night of the alleged murder, January 28, 2022, a Saturday night. The couple was drinking at C.F. McCarthy's before making their way to the waterfall bar across the street, around 11 p.m. Jennifer McCabe said she observed Reed walk into the waterfall bar holding a glass cup filled with a clear liquid, hiding it inside her coat. She believes it was a vodka soda drink. She also said the couple appeared to be in a good mood and didn't observe any arguments throughout the evening. This was consistent with all the witnesses police interviewed and surveillance footage from the bars. Reed and O'Keefe continued having drinks, but one witness said Reed didn't appear overly intoxicated. However, prosecutors say Reed had nine drinks in total that night. Reed says she only had four. When the bar was getting ready to close, everyone within this large group was invited back to 34 Fairview Road, the home of Jennifer McCabe's sister and brother-in-law, Nicole and Brian Albert. Jennifer McCabe is not only a relative to the person where O'Keefe's body was found, she's an important witness to the state's case and has been the subject of a lot of speculation and conspiracy when it comes to her testimony. Shortly after midnight, John O'Keefe texts Jennifer McCabe. He says, where to? She responds at 12.14 a.m. with the address. Four minutes later, O'Keefe called her to get more specific directions to the house. Shortly after that, Miss McCabe sees Reed's car pull up, a 2021 black Lexus SUV. We know for sure that at some point John O'Keefe exits the vehicle, but from there is where the accounts of what happened diverge completely. Karen Reed's story is very different from the nine people in attendance at the party. Reed says that once he exits the vehicle, he enters the home through a side door. She waits for 10 minutes and then gets frustrated that she still hasn't heard back from him. She then drives back to O'Keefe's home, but continued calling him until she fell asleep, around 1.30 a.m. One witness named Ryan Nagel arrived at the Fairview home at the same time as Reed's vehicle and apparently stopped close behind it. He was there to pick up his sister, who eventually changed her mind and said she would spend the night there instead. When he pulled away from the home, he saw Karen Reed at the wheel, alone, inside the SUV. According to Jennifer McCabe and everyone else inside that home on Fairview, John O'Keefe never came inside. When she saw the Lexus pull up in front of the home, she texted O'Keefe at 12.31 a.m., 
She said, hello? Nine minutes later, she texts him again, pull up behind me. She was telling O'Keefe to pull into the driveway behind her on the right side of the property. Instead, she saw the Lexus move forward to the left side of the property, between a fire hydrant and a flagpole. This is where O'Keefe's body would subsequently be discovered. Miss McCabe didn't see John O'Keefe get hit by the vehicle. She didn't see him at all, apparently. Five minutes later, she texts him again. Hello? That's when, she says, she observes the Lexus, driven by Karen Reed, drive away from the home. But again, she doesn't see any sign of John O'Keefe. Reed says she woke up several hours later before 5 a.m. and noticed O'Keefe still wasn't home. She started canvassing the neighborhood, but after 20 minutes of searching, decided to call Jennifer McCabe and Carrie Roberts for help. All three of them meet up, and Miss McCabe ends up driving Reed's vehicle because Reed was way too hysterical. They go back to O'Keefe's house. Miss Roberts followed behind them in her own vehicle. While on the way there, Reed apparently made statements like, Could I have hit him? Did I hit him? And mentioned the cracked taillight on her Lexus. After arriving at O'Keefe's home, they all piled into Carrie Roberts' vehicle to continue searching for O'Keefe. At this point, the weather outside is in the low teens. It was actively snowing, and visibility was very poor. As the women came upon 34 Fairview Road, from the back seat, Reed screams to open the door that she sees O'Keefe's body. Miss McCabe and Miss Roberts were confused because they couldn't see anything, but Reed apparently ran directly to the site of O'Keefe's body, buried beneath one to six inches of snowfall. We don't know the exact amount of snowfall yet, but that will be highly relevant at the trial. His phone was apparently on the ground underneath him. Reed immediately jumped on O'Keefe's body in an attempt to keep him warm and started CPR. Jennifer McCabe says that Reed yelled at her twice to Google, quote, how long do you have to be left outside to die from hypothermia or something to that effect? And this is one of the many details that's going to be very contentious at trial because an expert for the defense says that Jennifer McCabe googled how long to die in the cold hours before John O'Keefe's body was discovered. On January 31st, an autopsy was conducted by the chief medical examiner. She observed several abrasions on the victim's right forearm, two swollen black eyes, a small cut above the right eye, a cut to the left side of the nose, a two-inch laceration on the back right of the head, and multiple skull fractures. The black eyes apparently the result of severe head trauma. She further advised to the troopers that O'Keefe's pancreas was a dark red color, indicating hypothermia was a contributing factor to his death. Prosecutors have two theories as to how O'Keefe sustained these injuries that ultimately led to his death. One. Karen Reed suddenly became angry with him outside the home, reversed her SUV into him, shattering her taillight in the process, then fleeing the scene. 2. Reed became angry with O'Keefe and struck him in the head with a cocktail glass before reversing into him, shattering her taillight and driving off. A broken cocktail-style glass and multiple patches of red that appeared to be blood were found in the vicinity of the body. So where did this cocktail glass come from? The defense says it may have come from inside the Alberts' residence, but in a motion from prosecutors, they note surveillance footage of John O'Keefe hours before his death at the Waterfall Bar. At approximately 12.10 a.m., the defendant, Reed, walks out with two females, leaving through the front door. Moments later, the victim, O'Keefe, is standing alone at the table, takes a sip from a short cocktail glass, and walks out the front door, holding the glass in his right hand. He's then observed on exterior cameras walking out at approximately 12.11 a.m., carrying a short cocktail glass in his right hand. 
He meets up with the defendant, and the two walk together towards Washington Street. It seems like the prosecution believes this is where the cocktail glass came from that was found broken around O'Keefe's body. During the initial search of the crime scene, authorities did not recover any pieces of broken taillight. I'm not sure at what time, possibly later that evening, maybe at night, but the same day, authorities activated the Massachusetts State Police Special Emergency Response Team, aka CERT. CERT found evidence on the scene that originally went unnoticed, probably because of the active snowfall on the crime scene. The defense theorizes some of this evidence was planted, specifically by another officer who came by two to three days later once the snow had melted and found another piece of taillight. CERT was able to locate a black Nike sneaker belonging to O'Keefe, as well as several red and clear plastic pieces of taillight after digging through the snow. This is apparently consistent with Karen Reed's broken taillight. On the other hand, the defense claims Reed's taillight was actually broken hours after O'Keefe had died. Ring camera footage from O'Keefe's home captures Reed backing her SUV out of the garage. This was around 5.08 a.m. on January 29th, when she was allegedly heading out to search for him. It appears that her back right taillight might have made contact with O'Keefe's parked vehicle, and we see that as she pulls away, it's clear that her back right taillight is in fact broken. Prosecutors say she did not break her taillight at that moment. When troopers searched that area on February 3rd, they found no pieces of taillight or any evidence on O'Keefe's car that it was struck. Another thing to note about Karen Reed's vehicles is the fact that she has a backup camera. My car is 13 years old, so I don't have one of those, but I've ridden in plenty of cars that do. And when you're about to back into something, the car immediately alerts you audibly and visually on a screen right in front of your face. When authorities analyzed and took samples from Reed's vehicle, they noticed damage to the rear of the vehicle on the passenger side, including a dent with chipped paint in the trunk door, a broken taillight, and scratches on the bumper. On the rear passenger side quarter panel, forensic testing confirmed they'd found a human hair. However, the defense has come out and said that the person who tested that hair actually failed their qualification test to test human hair literally a month prior. They also believe that O'Keefe sustained these wounds from a brutal beating inside the Alberts Fairview home, some of which allegedly came directly from Brian Alberts' German Shepherd canine, Chloe. It was the family's dog for seven years that was rehomed or given away to an unknown location a few months after O'Keefe's death. One story is that this dog was rehomed after it got into a fight with another dog in the neighborhood. When a man tried to step in and separate them, he apparently suffered a puncture wound by Chloe. And apparently, in an attempt to avoid any legal issues or have to put the dog down, the Alberts chose to give her away instead. The defense says they got rid of the dog to destroy evidence that Chloe was actually involved in the fight. They believe the abrasions on O'Keefe's arms are from the dog scratching and or biting him while he scuffled with someone or several people at the party. However, the state has tested these wounds for dog DNA, and they say there's no traces of it. A number of experts weighing in on the autopsy photo also seem to agree that the abrasions do not look like they came from a dog. There's speculation that these scratch marks actually came from something on Karen Reed's vehicle that scratched him as he was run over. But what about digital evidence? The defense has hired an expert in computer forensics and electronic data analysis, Richard Green. Green analyzed the data on John O'Keefe's phone, as well as Jennifer McCabe's phone. Here are some quotes from their motion. Data stored on O'Keefe's cell phone establishes that O'Keefe did, in fact, get out of the car and walk somewhere in the early morning of January 29, 2022, at a point in time when his location was consistent with being in the vicinity of the Albert residence. Between 12.21 and 12.24 a.m., Apple Health recorded O'Keefe taking 80 steps, traveling approximately 87 meters, 
and climbing the equivalent of three floors. The only reasonable interpretation is that O'Keefe entered the Albert residence, which has three floors. Between 1231 and 1232, it again recorded O'Keefe taking 36 steps with no elevation gain, approximately 25 meters. O'Keefe did not walk the length of three swimming pools and climb three flights of stairs by circling and climbing on top of Karen Reed's vehicle. Jennifer McCabe's phone is a huge part of why this case blew up in the media. She voluntarily gave her phone to police so they could conduct a forensic analysis on February 2, 2022, days after O'Keefe's death. Instead of giving a copy of the full forensic image of her phone, one trooper prepared his own report to turn over to the defense. That was given to them on May 31, 2022. The defense is arguing that this trooper intentionally withheld exculpatory information from Ms. McCabe's cell phone that would prove her statements to police were false. The defense didn't get the full forensic image of Ms. McCabe's phone until February 8, 2023, and that is the same day they received a copy of data from O'Keefe's phone. According to the defense, information obtained from a deleted cache of Jennifer McCabe's cell phone begins to unravel what occurred after Ms. Reed left O'Keefe at the Albert residence and the web of lies that resulted in the arrest and prosecution of Ms. Reed. This next section is a motion from the defense that outlines Ms. McCabe's statements to police and how they allegedly conflict with the data extracted from her phone. Quote, According to Ms. McCabe's initial interview with Trooper Proctor on January 29, 2022, at 11.30 a.m., she claimed she left the Albert residence with her husband at approximately 1.30 a.m. and went home. However, a forensic analysis of her cell phone shows she actually left at 1.47 a.m. Moreover, she didn't drive directly home with her husband, as she initially claimed. Instead, the McCabes made the executive decision at 2 a.m. in a snowstorm to drop off two of Brian Albert Jr.'s friends, who were in attendance at the party, passing O'Keefe's residence on their way home. The McCabes clearly wanted to know where Miss Reed would be home, to notice if and when O'Keefe failed to return home that morning, or if that privilege would be left to his two adopted children. After passing O'Keefe's home, location data shows Jennifer McCabe arrived back at her home at 2.12 a.m. Ten minutes later, she climbs one flight of stairs, presumably to go upstairs to her bedroom. When questioned by law enforcement as to why O'Keefe never made it into the party, she told law enforcement, quote, she did not think anything of it and thought Reed and O'Keefe just decided not to come in. However, at 2.27 a.m. that morning, after making it safely home and climbing the stairs to the privacy of her bedroom, the first and only information Miss McCabe desperately needed to Google was, quote, Hoss long to die in the cold. H-O-S, long to die in the cold. Obviously a typo. Contrary to her assertions to law enforcement, she obviously had a lot on her mind. Jennifer McCabe didn't sleep that night. Data taken from her Apple Watch establishes that she was up much of the night pacing. At 2.32 a.m., she took 22 steps. At 3.50 a.m., she took 24 steps. At 3.51 a.m., she took 6 steps. At 4.55 a.m., she took 24 steps. Now let's go to the moment that Karen Reed, Jennifer McCabe, and Carrie Roberts arrive in front of the Albert's home around 6 a.m. The defense asserts that O'Keefe's body was clearly visible and that only an inch or less of snow had accumulated on him. Jennifer McCabe is the one who calls 911 to report the incident at 6.04 a.m. Immediately after hanging up with the 911 dispatcher, she makes two calls to her sister, Nicole Alberts, both of which were apparently answered for a few seconds and subsequently deleted from her phone, according to the defense. Nicole and Brian Albert claimed they were asleep that morning and didn't know about the emergency going on on their front lawn until Jennifer McCabe came into their bedroom to inform them. 
Miss Albert further stated that she, quote, never left her home to see what was going on outside, and by the time she came downstairs, the Canton Fire Department must have already transported O'Keefe from the scene. Thus, Brian and Nicole Albert were among the first individuals to be notified that O'Keefe was lying unresponsive, mere feet away on their front lawn, and in spite of being in such close proximity, made no effort to go outside and assist or otherwise investigate the emergency that was unfolding on their doorstep. Either Nicole is lying or Jennifer McCabe was on the phone with her husband, Brian Albert. Either way, Brian and Nicole Albert chose to sequester themselves in their home, distancing themselves from the investigation, rather than check on O'Keefe, assist in life-saving efforts, speak with responding officers, or otherwise investigate the circumstances surrounding the fact that their family member had just discovered the body of a Boston police officer on their front lawn. At 6.23 a.m., Jennifer McCabe makes an outgoing call to her brother-in-law, Brian Albert, which he doesn't answer, and then subsequently deletes the record of that call. Less than a minute later, she begins panicking and opens an article in her Safari app by Healthline, entitled, How Long Does It Take to Digest Food? Quick reminder that I'm still quoting the defense's motions. These are not my words. What an unbelievably odd and incriminating thing to search immediately upon finding a dead body. Significantly, the presence of food particles in a decedent's stomach and upper small intestine serve as a source of information for pathologists in calculating time of death. Almost immediately thereafter, Jennifer McCabe tried to overwrite her incriminating search from earlier that morning regarding how long does it take to die in the cold by re-entering it at a more appropriate time after she supposedly finds O'Keefe's body in the cold. However, in all the commotion and in her haste to cover up her incriminating 2.27 a.m. search, she accidentally searches how long T-I die in C-I-K-D at 6.23 a.m. Then again at 6.24 a.m., she enters a second search, this time repeating her search for Hoss Long to Die in the Cold, spelled H-O-S, Long to Die in the Cold, again. In this motion, the defense claims that Jennifer McCabe told police Karen Reed told her to make that search but apparently she only brought it up for the first time on February 1st, after her initial interview with police. They also claim their expert has evidence that she deleted the initial search made at 2.27 a.m., but did not attempt to delete the two other subsequent searches after O'Keefe's body was found. At 12.53 p.m. on January 29, hours after O'Keefe's body was discovered, Miss McCabe also allegedly deleted a screenshot she took of Brian Albert's contact information. It's also important to note that authorities never conducted a search at the Alberts' residence nor their fenced-in backyard. So prosecutors responded to this motion by the defense about the phone data recovered, stating, quote, To call this data unreliable is an understatement. They go on to say that the data showing O'Keefe ascending and descending within the Alberts' home actually took place before he even arrived at 34 Fairview Road. In terms of the searches made on Jennifer McCabe's phone, prosecutors say the file this data was stored on is a WAL file, and it's not even something that iPhone users have access to that they could even delete. Prosecutors also say she never searched how long does it take to digest food. A URL pertaining to that from the Safari Cache records actually brings up an image of a person with a plate of food on a counter cutting up said food. So they're asserting that Miss McCabe never made this search, it was just captured by the cache at some point, and that she also never deleted any of her Google searches that Karen Reed told her to make. Months after the defense publicly accused the Albert family of being involved in O'Keefe's death, they listed their home for sale. This home had apparently been in the family for multiple generations. The Alberts also had their basement floor redone shortly after the incident. 
And because the defense's theory is that O'Keefe was attacked inside the home and then dragged outside, it's led to speculation that the Alberts were covering up any trace of that. One could also argue, though, that they wanted to move because a man was found dead on their front lawn. A lot of people were selling their homes during COVID because the prices were going up, or maybe because they were being harassed by one or more of Karen Reed's supporters. Three days after John O'Keefe's mysterious death, Karen Reed was arrested and charged with manslaughter. Her father is the one who posted her $50,000 bail, and he stood strongly behind her throughout this whole entire case. Weeks later, on February 22, 2022, authorities interviewed O'Keefe's 10-year-old nephew and 14-year-old niece. They indicated that they had both lived with their uncle for about eight years following the passing of their parents. They also said their uncle and Karen Reed had been dating for roughly two years, and Reed would stay the night at their house several nights a week. The nephew told officers that the couple argued, quote, a decent amount of time, and recalled a recent argument over groceries in which O'Keefe said he needed a break from Reed. After this argument, he wanted Reed to leave the house, but Reed refused. The niece also recalled the couple arguing a lot towards the end, about two to three times a week. She also recalled a specific argument that took place a week prior to O'Keefe's death. She was apparently sitting on the stairway within earshot of the conversation. She says she heard her uncle tell Reed that their relationship had run its course and that it isn't healthy. On the night of O'Keefe's death, his niece was the only one at home. She says she went to bed around 11 p.m. after her friend left, and her brother was at a friend's house. But she was awoken the next morning by Karen Reed, screaming and acting frantic. She also said that while Reed was on the phone with Jennifer McCabe, Reed changed her story several times as to what really happened, initially saying that she and O'Keefe got into an argument and she dropped him off. June 10, 2022, a Norfolk County grand jury indicts Reed on charges of second-degree murder, manslaughter while operating under the influence of alcohol, and leaving the scene of a personal injury or death. While being processed at the police station, an officer's body cam footage captures their interaction. This is evidence that the prosecutors really want to be able to use in trial. The officer reads the charges and explains that second-degree murder is a much worse offense than what she was initially charged with, and usually people don't bond out after getting that charge. Reed responds, quote, Okay, and you're aware he was beaten up by Brian and Colin Albert? I mean, we're all in on the same joke, right? My taillight is cracked and John was pulverized. Reed posted her $100,000 bond and has been free ever since. As the defense and prosecutors filed motions in the case, it began to draw more and more attention as the details came out, largely because Reed's theory is that the entire department, actually multiple departments, are covering up what really happened. Fast forward to May 2023. For the first time in court, the defense starts to unravel their theory about the case. They say John O'Keefe was involved in a fight inside Brian Albert's home, that his body was later dumped outside in the snow, that the wounds on his arms came from Albert's dog, Chloe. Two weeks later, during a pretrial hearing, the defense goes into more detail about what they believe is a cover-up by law enforcement. They tell the judge, quote, Certainly, the Massachusetts State Police is involved. There are people that were in that house that are involved. Brian Albert is involved. Jennifer McCabe is involved. The rest of the folks that were in that house, there's some level of involvement by every one of them. Every single one of them. We're not going to rest until we get to the bottom of exactly who's behind this cover-up. Not only Karen Reed deserves this, John O'Keefe deserves this, and has deserved this from moment one. And that's why we're not going to rest. After this hearing, Reed spoke outside the courthouse to reporters for the first time. He said it feels we're the only ones fighting for the truth of what happened to John O'Keefe. And me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. Just feels like no one else wants it. Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. 
We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. Yes, we do. And no, she didn't do it. No, she didn't do it. Definitely. This is an innocent woman. Definitely. She didn't do it. I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at 6 in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. On August 1, prosecutors motioned for a gag order on the case, saying witnesses were being harassed. The judge denied the motion and said that the state was actually the one controlling the narrative. At the end of the month, District Attorney Michael Morrissey released a video statement slamming the defense's theory. In part, he said, quote, Conspiracy theories are not evidence. The idea that multiple departments, EMTs, fire personnel, the medical examiner, and the prosecuting agency joined in, or taken in by a vast conspiracy, should be seen for what it is, completely contrary to the evidence and a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. An NBC Dateline exclusive. Karen Reed, the Mansfield woman with ties to Dighton, accused of murdering her boyfriend, a Boston police officer, speaks out, claiming he was set up and she was framed. I texted him, I called him, and within minutes of him exiting my car, is not answering his phone. Minutes. We were happy, having fun, laughing, uh, just very normal. His eyes were swollen shut. He had blood dripping out of his nose. She found John lying here in the snow outside of the home she dropped him at, calling 911 and blurting out her thoughts as first responders got there. Did you say, I wonder if I hit him? Did I said, I, did I kill him? I said, could I have hit him? There is a lot going on in this case other than the back and forth between prosecutors and the defense. In April 2023, the United States Attorney's Office in Boston, the Department of Justice, launched their own investigation into how the Reed case was being handled. And apparently they did not inform the Norfolk District Attorney's Office who's prosecuting the case. The prosecution had to find out from a few of their own grand jury witnesses who were apparently contacted by the FBI and subpoenaed before a federal grand jury. Letters between the prosecutors and the DOJ were released to the public in January of this year. The state is not happy about this federal investigation. They wrote that it's unprecedented for the federal government to step into the middle of an ongoing state murder case. They called it highly unusual and a possible abusive exercise of power. The state then requested any evidence that the DOJ had, arguing that they have to turn that evidence over to the defense. But the DOJ told them, quote, you can't turn over information that you don't have, which is either in reference to them saying they don't have any evidence, but actually, I think they're saying that the state, y'all don't have any evidence that we have, so you're actually not forced to turn that over, and we're not forced to turn that over. Prosecutors were not happy at this. They wanted the feds to stop their investigation and called for it to at least be transferred to a different office outside of Boston. There was quite a bit of back and forth, but in one response, the DOJ hints that their investigation is completely warranted. They said the DOJ, quote, has not reached any official determination whether prosecution is warranted, but they believe it is essential to continue their investigation given the information of which they are aware. At this time, we see no basis for recusal in this investigation. That was the last response from the DOJ made available to the public, dated August 3rd, 2023. The defense has said that this federal investigation is sort of spawned from trooper Michael Proctor, who allegedly hid his personal ties to people involved in the Reed case, witnesses in the case. Proctor is the lead investigator on the Karen Reed case, and the testimony from him and the evidence he's gathered will be critical at trial. He's also apparently had personal communications with Julie Albert, the sister-in-law of Brian Albert, and of course the defense is saying that Brian Albert was somehow involved in John O'Keefe's death. And actually in March of this year, state police opened an internal investigation into Proctor, citing, quote, a potential violation of department policy. Proctor has denied all of this through his lawyers, but we'll just have to see where that goes and if it comes up at trial. Now I want to talk about Turtle Boy. 
If you have looked into the Karen Reed case at all, you might have seen the name Turtle Boy thrown around. Aiden Kearney runs the blog TB Daily News under the moniker Turtle Boy. After initially looking into the case around April 2023, Turtle Boy was convinced Reed is innocent. Since then, he's dedicated his entire blog to covering the upcoming trial, but he's also taken it much further than your average web sleuth. Not only has he confronted witnesses in the case in public while filming it, he's also allegedly worked with a police dispatcher in Avon or Avon to illegally access motor vehicle data. I think it was to look up someone's plate number or something like that, but I could be wrong. But the information he was trying to access was allegedly a key witness for the state. He also sells free Karen Reed merch online, organizes groups to meet outside the courthouse, and even bought a free Karen Reed billboard just outside Gillette Stadium. Turtle Boy has written hundreds of articles about this case. He's apparently left voicemails on the phones of witnesses and allegedly posted photos of their workplaces, homes, and or them going about their daily life. There is a lot of details and accusations about him I simply don't have time to go into, but just know that he's really passionate about this case. And one could say that his passion led to the next event. In October 2023, Turtle Boy was arrested and charged with witness intimidation. He posted a $1,000 bond after the judge ordered him to stay away from all witnesses listed by the prosecution. After pleading not guilty to the charges, he told the press, quote, They will never shut me up. They will never, ever stop me from reporting the truth about what happened to John O'Keefe. Reporting the news is not harassment. Asking questions is not harassment. Two months after Turtle Boy's arrest, a grand jury indicted him on 16 new charges, including eight counts of witness intimidation, three counts of conspiracy to intimidate witnesses, and five counts of picketing a witness. I read in a recent article that some of those witness intimidation charges have been dropped, but not all of them. While Turtle Boy is out on bond, there was an incident involving his girlfriend of just a few months. Apparently, she was subpoenaed for the investigation into Turtle Boy, and Turtle Boy agreed to come to her apartment to talk about it on December 23rd. During that three to four hour period, the now ex-girlfriend claimed Turtle Boy threatened to release her personal information and explicit photos of her, then ultimately pushed her into a couch. Prosecutors said Turtle Boy, quote, threatened her in saying that if she didn't cooperate, he would destroy her in front of her kids by publishing old probate court records that he had acquired. They also found that he recorded that confrontation and posted an edited version online. Three days after that incident, Turtle Boy was charged with assault and battery and witness intimidation. A judge revoked his bond, forcing him to spend 60 days in jail. In January of this year, we find out that Turtle Boy has actually been allegedly speaking with Karen Reed. An affidavit alleges that Reed sent him personal details about witnesses in the case, as well as autopsy photos, crime scene photos, images of her car, and the 911 call made when O'Keefe's body was found. Turtle Boy and Karen Reed allegedly communicated for more than 40 hours during 189 phone calls, as well as via intermediaries via a messaging app called Signal. From what I've seen and heard, this is a serious breach of court rules. Will we see this come up at Karen Reed's trial, though? I have no idea. The final pretrial hearing was held on April 12th of this year. The judge heard 30 different motions from both sides, and the most notable came from the defense when they finally identified who they believe may be involved in John O'Keefe's death, and why they should be allowed to make a third-party culprit defense to jurors. They named Brian Albert, Colin Albert, and Brian Higgins, all of whom were apparently present at the party the night O'Keefe died. As we know, Brian Albert owned the property where O'Keefe was killed. He's apparently the head of the fugitive unit for Boston police and has six siblings, one of them being Kevin Albert, a 20-year veteran of Canton PD, who's investigating the case. 
After the federal grand jury subpoenas went out, the defense believes Kevin repeatedly contacted Brian Higgins, one of the three people they believe is involved somehow. Brian Higgins is the ATF agent and has an office in the Canton Police Department. And two weeks before O'Keefe's death, he has allegedly said that Karen Reed unexpectedly kissed him on the lips while he was at O'Keefe's house to watch football. The last person the defense named as possibly being involved in O'Keefe's death is Colin Albert. Colin is the nephew of Brian Albert and he was only 17 years old at the time of O'Keefe's death. Colin has also apparently said that he left his uncle's house before everyone arrived from the waterfall bar, but the defense claims Colin didn't leave the house until around 12.30 a.m. I know I threw a lot of names out there, but if you want to know more details about people that may or may not be involved, people that have been mentioned by the defense, there's a link in the description below to Court TV's list of key players in the Karen Reed murder case. One perspective that continues to be drowned out in the reporting on this case is that of the victim's family members. So I want to wrap this episode up by reading an article from the Boston Globe written by Danny McDonald titled, A Courthouse Circus Surrounds His Alleged Killer, But John O'Keefe's Loved Ones Are Focused on Remembering a Good Man. By any measure, the few months that straddled 2013 and 2014 were a difficult and life-changing stretch for Officer John O'Keefe. His sister, Kristen, died from an aggressive form of brain cancer just months after her diagnosis. Eight days later, his partner and best friend at Boston Police, Pat Rogers, took his own life. Months after that, Kristen's husband, Stephen, died unexpectedly from a heart attack. But it was O'Keefe's response to such dark times that those who knew him say is a lasting testament to his character. He jumped to become the guardian of his niece, Kaylee, then six, and nephew Patrick, then three, morphing into a suburban dad practically overnight, helping with homework, driving to and from softball practice. He was a good man, said John Jackson, a close friend of O'Keefe's from college. O'Keefe's life was cut short, prosecutors say, when his girlfriend at the time allegedly ran him over and left him for dead in Canton during a blizzard in 2022 after a night of heavy drinking. The court case has attracted national attention, and some fear that the memory of who O'Keefe was has been lost amid the circus atmosphere that for months has pervaded the Dedham Courthouse where the trial will begin April 16th for his alleged killer, Karen Reed. Gaggles of protesters, egged on by social media and blogger-fueled allegations of a cover-up, have waved placards that rallied against police and prosecution, at times even booing and shouting at O'Keefe's friends, parents, and brother in what loved ones view as a stunning breach of common decency. Yelling at the victim's family members is absolutely insane, and it honestly makes me glad that the judge approved a 200-foot buffer zone because obviously we have the right to free speech, but to yell at the victim's family members when they're already grieving this loss and trying to seek justice, it's disgusting. Okay, back to the article. Several of O'Keefe's friends and family members told The Globe the spectacle has distracted from the real shame of the case the loss of a loving uncle, a loyal and generous friend, and a dedicated police officer. Reed has pleaded not guilty to charges of second-degree murder, motor vehicle homicide by negligent operation, and leaving the scene of an accident causing personal injury and death. She contends she is the innocent victim of a cover-up by Canton police and local prosecutors seeking to pin O'Keefe's death on her and protect the true killer or killers. A charge the Norfolk District Attorney denies, Reed remains free on bail. Privately, O'Keefe's loved ones are convinced Reed is responsible for his death. Quote, no one planted anything in our heads, said his brother, Paul O'Keefe. Quote, no one brainwashed us. They say Reed facing consequences for O'Keefe's death would provide some modicum of justice. Paul O'Keefe hinted there was some friction between his brother and Reed in the weeks leading up to his death. He had considered hanging out with the couple on New Year's Eve, he said, but opted not to because Reed and his brother were bickering. He still kicked himself for not seeing more of John in the weeks preceding his death, he said. But Brendan Kane, who grew up with O'Keefe on the same street in Braintree, said he and his wife attended a Bruins game with Reed and O'Keefe three weeks prior to his death. Quote, she put on a good show, he said. We liked her. 
The case has rocked Canton, a suburb of 24,000 plus residents south of Boston, where O'Keefe was living at the time of his death and where his parents now take care of Kaylee and Patrick. The furor cannot change a cold reality. O'Keefe is dead. It's a finality that his family and friends still wrestle with. Paul O'Keefe, who attends every court hearing with his parents, said he still reaches for his phone to text his older brother. Most recently, it was when legendary Alabama football coach Nick Saban retired. Both O'Keefe's had grown up fans of the Crimson Tide, and he wanted to tell John the news. Quote, I don't think it's fully processed, he said. Paul O'Keefe said that his brother's catchphrase was, it's only a movie. It's etched onto John's headstone, and it was his brother's way of trying to take the edge off the craziness that life throws at you, he said. Several friends held up John O'Keefe's reaction to his sister's death as proof of his priorities. O'Keefe was living the life of a bachelor in Dorchester at the time, but moved to Canton and adjusted his work schedule to care for the children, cutting down on extra hours and switching to a more administrative role, and a 9-to-5-ish to five-ish shift to better support the children, his friends said. Quote, he did it so humbly and so matter-of-factly, added his friend Sean Coyle, a retired Boston firefighter. There was a steep learning curve to parenting, but, quote, he did it for eight years, said Paul O'Keefe. He did a pretty bang-up job, I thought. Payne remembers him as undoubtedly one of the most generous dudes I've ever met, who would always buy the first round of drinks when out with a large group of friends. Kane said O'Keefe always excelled at whatever sports kids in the neighborhood played, wiffle ball, street hockey, basketball. Boyle said O'Keefe would rib him about being a firefighter, greeting him with, here comes the hero, and joking that he could pop into Coyle's firehouse to say hi, that is, if Coyle wasn't sleeping. Friends describe O'Keefe as a Boston sports fan, traveling to other cities to take in away games of the Red Sox, Bruins, and Patriots. He attended opening day at Fenway Park religiously. On one such occasion, Coyle shared, Martin J. Walsh, then mayor of Boston, was involved in the ceremonial first pitch and wore a custom Sox jersey with the local area code 617, emblazoned on the back. Coyle made an offhand comment to O'Keefe that a jersey like that should be hanging in J.J. Foley's, a South End watering hole. O'Keefe was friends with Walsh's driver, a fellow Boston cop, and connected Coyle with him. Coyle eventually was able to pitch Walsh on his plans for the jersey, and the then-mayor met with him and O'Keefe in his city hall office, signed and gave him the shirt, and posed for pictures with the two friends. Things like that tended to happen when you were hanging out with O'Keefe, said Coyle, who had the shirt framed and gave it to the bar where it now hangs. Quote, we always had a lot of laughs, said Coyle. Coyle, a former Marine, got choked up multiple times over the course of a 45-minute interview when talking about his friend. He now lives in Florida but is staying in a Massachusetts hotel for the duration of the case. O'Keefe always wanted to be a police officer, his friends and family agreed. He liked order and rules. During a Super Bowl party at their parents' house while O'Keefe was in the bathroom, his sister changed the clock on the microwave to see how long it would take him to notice, Jackson recalled. When he emerged from the bathroom, quote, he didn't even break stride, walking immediately over to the appliance to make sure it read the right time. Jackson said that whenever a group of O'Keefe's friends would go out, he was typically the most responsible, and he would make note of things like where the exits were years before he became a police officer. He was made to be a cop, Jackson said. Their grandfather was a Boston police officer, and John had always looked up to him, Paul O'Keefe said. O'Keefe was an auxiliary police officer in Duxbury and Falmouth before joining the Boston Police Department at the age of 29. He was assigned to stations in Hyde Park, downtown, and Dorchester, and also worked on the sex offender unit during his 15-plus years working for the department, according to his department roster card. A fellow Boston police officer and friend used to tease O'Keefe that he was the sort of cop who looked like a cop even if he was off-duty and out of uniform. Quote, you have your friends who are goofballs who are good for a laugh, and you have your friends who are super serious. John was the perfect mix of both. The friend, who did not want his name published as he's not clear to speak to media, said during a recent phone interview. Jackson, who commuted with O'Keefe to Northeastern University from the South Shore for four years during the 1990s and named him godfather to his eldest daughter, said one of the best testaments to O'Keefe's character is that multiple ex-girlfriends have shown up to the courthouse to support his family. Quote, that shows not only did he not burn a bridge, but he maintained friendships. 
said Jackson during a recent phone interview. His brother, Paul, speaking in a cafe in Braintree, recently just down the road from where his brother is buried, shared multiple anecdotes of his sibling, John driving his friend to cancer treatments, John taking in a Red Sox game when a man he had arrested months earlier came over to him to say hello, a testament to how he did his job, Paul said. John staying by their sister's side when she was hospitalized with cancer. John grabbing checks for family dinner. Paul O'Keefe noted that many people say they would do anything for anyone, but far fewer people have a chance to prove that. Johnny proved it, he said. If he loved you, he took care of you. Karen Reed's murder trial begins with jury selection this Tuesday, April 16th. The jurors are being voir dired independently, meaning they'll be questioned by both sides one by one, so that process could take anywhere from two to three days. As of day one, they've only selected four, and after a whole day of court today, Wednesday, they've selected 11. I'm pretty sure they need 12 jury members plus two alternates, so they're probably going to start tomorrow, which is the morning that this episode is going to be up. I may or may not be live streaming this trial on TikTok or YouTube, but even if I don't, I'll definitely be watching every minute of this five to eight week trial. The judge has ruled to allow a third party culprit defense as long as they're able to present that to the court through adequate testimony and evidence. However, they are not allowed to talk about the third party culprit defense in their opening statements. The state is calling 87 witnesses and the defense is calling 71 witnesses. The judge also approved a 200-foot buffer zone for the protesters, the Karen Reed supporters, to prevent potential jury members from being influenced. So if you see somebody wearing a bright pink in the courtroom when you're watching the trial live, that is a Karen Reed supporter, but everyone else that doesn't make it into the courtroom will be 200 feet down the street. I'm going to end it here. Shout out to the new accomplices, Abby N, Ness P, Shauna, Miss Lucy, and Taylor LOL. And my Patreon is in the description below if you want ad-free, sometimes early episodes for just a dollar a month, too. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you all have a good day, evening, or night. Goodbye.